Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Insights Podcast uh, presented by Vantage Pro. We're uh, we're excited. I'm on location, which is just, I, I've been waiting to say that. I'm on location <laughs> this week. Uh, <laughs> But I'm uh, I'm at the uh, the lovely, beautiful new faith church in Glendora, California. Uh, Van, of course, my co-host in the uh, in the studio, the palatial uh, Riverside studio. At least and, this uh, this part is really palatial. <laughs> what's behind me? It's super palatial. I know so. the things we do for podcasts, right? It's, right. Uh, exactly. If yeah. you turn the camera around, it's it's really his garage. So. No, if you turn the camera around, it looks like a room full of Star Wars collectibles. And, now I want you to turn the camera around. Yeah, well, we'll right, do that later. Right, I'll, I'll right. send you some pictures, Tim. Exactly. We'll post those in the show notes. Um, yep. <laughs> what's behind the curtain? But uh, we're, yep. we're excited. Um, we've got a very special guest with us, um, Mr. Tim Foote, the CEO. We, we decided we were trying to come up with a cool title for you, but uh, uh, you can make that better. Just, you're just cool enough. Really, your accent's cool enough for everything, so you don't need a cool title. So, <laughs> thank, thank you, Duke. I actually just got back from perfecting my accent a few weeks in Australia. So, hopefully, you I'm got to practice. It. Yeah, you after being here for 22 it. years. Yep. 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 My uh, my my stepdad's actually from the Netherlands, and uh, ah. his accent. He's been here, gosh, what, 40 years now, and so. His his accent has gotten really weak, so when he goes back to the Netherlands, it's uh, they give him they give him a hard time. Well, Duke, the best compliment I get from the Aussie <laughs> when I'm there, which I got when I was there last week, okay. was, "Hey, you haven't lost your accent, so nice. I'll take it after 22 years." Isn't nice. that one of those things that when you go back into the into that culture that you it easily Pick just it starts. Again. Yeah, it comes back. Yeah, I think for me though, you know, you've got a lot of Aussies that married Americans, and they get the half and half. I call it. <laughs> And uh, my wife is British Australian, grew up in Australia. So at the end of the day, when the doors closed, we speak with Australian accents. And that's the, that's the key. Plus, I was 28 when I moved here. You can do the math. All right. And that yeah. means that I, I had a pretty developed accent by the time I hit the U.S. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Hey, it's Van. I'm just going to jump in here for a quick second and ask you that if you like this content, please leave a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Click that notification bell. And share this out on the socials if you can. And one more thing, leave a comment. We absolutely read them and we will respond to them. All right, back to the podcast. Hey, well, one of the reasons I want to have Tim on, Tim and I have known each other for a long time. And um, uh, obviously the folks that started Slingshot, uh, that many of you who know, who know me have heard me on podcasts or even know me in person know that uh, Stan Andicott is like one of my mentors. And um, for a long Mine time- too. I yeah. Well, many, like many, many, many people. I mean, I, I don't have them all. Yeah. I don't have them all to myself, which bums me out, but it's, you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, cause I worked with him at, at one of my previous churches. We got to serve on staff together and he really mm -hmm. has impacted my life. Like, so like literally probably thousands of other people. Um, and one of the cool things that, uh, he, he, he did with, uh, Monty Kelso was start slingshot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I just love about Slingshot is that they do something similar to kind of what we do when we're, when we're uh, starting a process with the church uh, to put AVL in is you guys have an entire process to actually find the staff member that they need. Um, you know, and I remember Stan always used to go, you know, you, you want to hire people that aren't looking. Um, <laughs> you know, so, and, and, and just things like that, just tons of wisdom. And so Tim and I have been trying to get on a podcast or do something together for quite a while. In fact, I actually remember we were somewhere about three years ago and I said, Hey, we should have you on the podcast. And, that, and so I don't know when that was, it's all a big blur, but, um, so can you like, for those of you who don't, for those who don't know you, Tim, can you like kind of give your a background a little bit and then kind of how you swung into being the CEO of Slingshot? Yeah. So uh, born and raised Tasmanian, which is a state of Australia. Uh, first ministry was uh, nine years in the beautiful city of Sydney, which I would argue is mm. one of the best, if not the best city in the world. And I uh, thought I'd spend the rest of my life career in Sydney. 
Uh, I did ministry by day and worked in the music industry by night. I was in the entertainment world. Uh, that was my tent making job in order to make enough money to live in the city and do ministry and loved it. And then as God wills it, and you, when you say yes to him, you can end up anywhere. Uh, 2002, my wife and I, after two years of marriage, moved to Boulder County, Colorado. Wow. And I joined the exec team of a church uh, in a town Hello. called Long church called LifeBridge and was the worship pastor there for, I think, 15 years, built ministry for 10 years and knew Money and Stan, both of, of, who, uh, who are great mentors in my life and dear friends, knew them before. Actually, I knew Monty before I moved to the US, Stan when I moved here. So coming up, well, 25 years knowing Monty and 22, 23 knowing Stan, knew them before they started Slingshot. Uh, and watched it all go down as Vance, uh, as Van, you probably watched it all go down. Yep. And, uh, and they pioneered the way uh, in staffing and coaching in uh, the creative space. And uh, I, I watched them launch this. And then uh, shortly after, I'd refer to church to, uh, to, to Monty and Stan to find a worship pastor. And it was in our area. Monty came, and, uh, came into Colorado and said, hey, why don't you try this? And I'd been singular focused on the church for quite a while and, and God had been doing a stirring in me. And I said, yeah, I'll give it a try. And so I joined the team uh, bivocationally when it was maybe five of us and a handful of uh, staffing and coaching engagements. And soon after uh, I joined, we expanded to every area of ministry in the church space. And they invited me to lead their uh, the founding division, which was a huge honor for me. And, and Van, you were even involved uh, in those early days as well. Those, those yeah. are a lot of great memories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, over the next eight to 10 years, it absolutely exploded. And yeah. uh, both staffing and coaching, we added nonprofit. Uh, my ministry trajectory changed as well. And uh, back in, gosh, was it 2019, uh, Stan and Monty invited me to uh, step in and lead the senior leadership division because I've been doing a lot of work with uh, strategic work with churches, lead pastors, executive pastors, thinking around staffing. And so I stepped into that role. Uh, and then uh, in uh, the start of 2022, uh, uh, in the summer of 21, they invited me to step into the CEO role and, and started that at the start of uh, 2022. So it's been a wild ride watching it all happen. And now I say to people, my full time and a half job is running Slingshot. And it truly is that working with between three and 400 ministry organizations a year, you can imagine what a day in the life is like. Uh, but I tell people my golf game, I was never good at golf. My golf game is still local church ministry because it's my first love vocationally. And so I'm still very, 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 very part time at the church that I moved here to 22 years ago. And I teach there uh, eight or nine times a year. And I love getting to do that. Uh, and then they let me even be on worship team like once a month. And that's just like, <laughs> this is putting on, like putting on an old pair of shoes. Apparently, I'm not too old to still get up there and, and be on it. Maybe it's the multi-generational that they need. But uh, leading. It's, the, it's the accent. It's Maybe. the accent. Yeah. It's the accent. Yeah. Amer Americans will put accents on stage no matter how old they are. They, they love the accent. Well, that, that's good to know. So I'm safe for a month. But, <laughs> yeah. but it's good still getting to do a little bit of music. But, uh, yeah, it's it's an absolute joy to to lead the team at Slingshot. I think we've got the best team in the world. I mean, every leader is going to say that about their team. I think it's true about ours. I think we're the best at what we do. And uh, I, I think we – all of our people are practitioners and love the church and nonprofit space because we do nonprofit as well ministries. And it's, I, I love getting to lead this team. It's also the, the, one of the most stretching things in my life. The other stretching thing is being a dad to two uh, teenage boys, 16 and 14. The dad thing, the parent thing, that's pretty stretching too. But it's a great life. But, yeah, and I just saw a picture. I just saw a picture came across to Instagram or Facebook or whatever. I couldn't believe how, how old they are. It's like they're I hadn't huge. seen a picture of them in a while. I was like, wow. And they're huge. And we're at a lot of basketball and football games that they're playing. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Well, you know, um, as Duke and I were talking, we like to have guests that are, I mean, obviously we do AVL integration, you know, and we work with a ton of churches. But, you know, the one of the things that we have uh, encountered and one of the things that we talk about a lot is changing in the industry uh, uh, of, of integration. And because we do churches, you know, the, the, the landscape has changed so much since Duke and I were tech directors. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, 
one of the things I'd love to hear your thoughts on is because you've been doing this because you've been how long were you, have you been with you've been with Slingshot since the beginning, right? Yeah, just after. So Slingshot's yeah. but we're we're probably in our fifteenth or sixteenth right, year, which doesn't yeah, seem I, possible. I was in like a couple of years after that when it yeah. just after it started. Yeah, yeah, because I that was when I and I was doing some of the tech searches back then. Kind mm-hmm. of, I think that's how we met at one of the retreats. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, you know, in 15 years, staffing for tech in church yeah. has changed yeah. immensely, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. So kind of talk about what you see, you've seen over like even, you know, where we were po- pre COVID and post COVID, um, what, what, like where, what's, what's changed in the last five years with what churches want as far as technical people that you're putting into these churches? Mm. I mean, everything has changed. And then some days you wonder if people realized whether anything changed <laughs> because pre COVID it was, I mean, it, it was, it was fairly standard. We were still educating churches on the need for prioritizing this role, uh, knowing where things were headed in the digital space. Then COVID happened and and uh, catapulted us 10 years into the future. And then we had a sudden pendulum swing uh, when people started meeting again. Uh, the churches that are thriving are the ones that have really taken on board what they learned. But I, I, I'm sure you guys would, uh, would affirm that there's such a specific skill set needed now uh, post-COVID because of what we've learned about digital presence and uh, the need to not only focus on uh, community in a church space, because you can get great worship and great teaching online anytime you want on demand. So right now, the churches that are thriving are the churches that can provide a non-distracting environment with excellence, but can also provide community for people, authentic community. And so uh, what what's needed in a tech director, and we know uh, in churches of, several hundred to uh, 1,200, 1,500, the tech director is dealing with a bunch of volunteers, is uh, is skill, but also the ability to lead leaders and pastor a team and, yeah. and pass off the expertise. Now, we know at the bigger churches now, uh, the tech director is leading specialists. And so there's a whole generalist versus specialist thing that topic and debate that we could have as well about what's needed. But it's it's a it's a really unique skill set. We're also finding, and this might be a, a, another topic you want to delve into too, that uh, that it's really hard for churches to get um, a, a, a production director with experience, be able to pay them what they need to pay them based on what that production director can earn in what we're calling the gig economy, basically contract work, both in marketplace and in church space. So we're seeing a lot of contract work taking over. And for some churches, it's a survival technique because they can't afford a full-time person. Yeah. 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 Well, and like I'm in California and, you know, California has all kinds of crazy labor laws, you know, that came about the last couple of years about the gig economy, you know, and they kind of decimated a lot of people's incomes right away. But what people in our industry did was they all just started, they all just went over and got, they all went out and got a business license and made up some name. And then you're fine. The minute you do that, you're, you're okay in California. So you can, then you can, you know, you can still, file as an individual and still do your thing. You just has to be, you know, pay your business tax in your city or right, whatever. Right. Right. But you know, it's just, I, I, to me, the thing that's, that always, and you're right. And especially here, like where I am, where you have so many, I have so many conversations and, uh, about, uh, in Southern California, I think in the big areas where there's a lot of entertainment, there's a lot of venues, there's, and there's a lot of churches, it's very hard for churches to get the skilled people because right. they, you know, I'm like where I am. I know a dozen people that work at Disney, the Disney parks and you can't swing a cat in Southern California without hitting a big church that can not afford to hire, you know, the good techs. Well, I, I think it's expectations though. I think that's the challenge with it is it's, it's not that a church can or can't afford it. It's mm. really a, more often than not. I mean, there there are sometimes where legitimately cash is just the topic, but 
I think more often than not, it's usually about having aligned expectations. Right. Um, you know, we expect a great leader. We expect a highly skilled technician. We expect this, 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 and this, but then we expect an entry level salary. And it's like, well, those, those expectations just aren't aligned. You can get those things, but you're going to have to get your salary aligned to what you're expecting from a job duty and from a, a performance standpoint. And I think that's the challenge I see more often than not is, you know, when we're working with churches, um, you know, the pastor's looking for the unicorn. He's looking for somebody who's going to be an amazing leader and already has it all there. Nobody's found it yet. Um, and but but they don't know it yet either. And so they're cheap. <laughs> you know, your word alignment um, carries a lot of weight to it because, I mean, we know that uh, that leadership relationships break down because of um, lack of alignment and lack of clear expectations. Mm -hmm. And I think for churches to get their get what they're expecting aligned and what they need to pay. I mean, we're having those conversations more than we ever have. But then for tech leaders too to have a calling to the local church. I mean, that's mm. what we're that's what we're having to talk about all the time now, because we had the, the great with resignation, the big quit, and we had people dumping out of ministry. And, you know, on, on our calls internally at Slingshot, you know, we've got 65 people around the country now. We're doing this, would you believe, Ann? Um, but we're, on our internal calls, we're, yeah, we're talking about how do we tell a more beautiful story? about what it means to serve on the front lines of ministry. I mean, those are the heroes that are that I mean, you're sitting there right now, Duke. I mean, those are the heroes that are in the local church serving week in and week out, seeing life transformation happening, right. making eternal investments. And so there is going to be sacrifice. I mean, we know that there is going to be sacrifice when you are called to the local church. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to feed your family and live a decent lifestyle in the place that you're called to. Well, and I think yeah. that's the other sure. challenge, too, with the expectations is, um, you know, a lot of times, uh, and, and this was certainly true. I don't think this has actually changed much at all, uh, at least in, in the uh, 25, 30 years I've been around it. But uh, uh, this idea that, you know, pastors often will take a Friday and a Saturday off, like they'll get their days off, they'll find this. But then the tech guys have to be on Monday to debrief. They have to be on fr on Friday to uh, set up for the weekend. They might have to deal with the youth stuff in the middle. And like at some point, it's like, okay, so where where does the production department's actual day off? Um, and the number add of guys. To that, add to that, and this is what we saw in production world and com world during COVID. They got hammered, as in yeah. there was no time off for them. I mean, there were some ministry areas where it was a, it was it was a holiday. I mean, it, it was it was vacation time almost, and and I don't mean that to be offensive, but honestly, I mean, they were in the home office. There was, yep. I mean, they, they they weren't able to operate the way. They well, if you're a youth that. pastor or a kids pastor, you can't be around youth or kids. You said it, you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's but for but for tech and calm. I mean, we saw them. We saw those leaders burning out oh, yeah. everywhere. Oh, and yeah. that's and that's part of why some burnt out of ministry and yeah. still are not back. I think it's yeah. a perfect storm when it comes to these areas of ministry. And to to your point, dude. Well, yeah. and even 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 in the the you know the non church world, um, I was talking to a buddy of mine who's who's uh, in higher up in management at Disneyland, and he was saying that because they furloughed you know, some all the amusement parks had to furlough a lot of people, right? Well, yeah. the older ones, like the ones my age and older, they packaged them out. They said, here, we'll just give you like three years of salary and see you later. You know, we'll give you three or four years of salary, which seems like a lot of money, but honestly, to keep them around an unknown time was could have cost them more money. And then when right. the parks did open back up, they called all those guys up and men and women up and most of them were like, no, nah, you know, we actually enjoy hanging right. out with our grandkids and we're, I'm doing this thing on the side and I started a wood shop and we started a, you know, whatever, blah, 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 all the things. And we don't want to come back. And so if you look like, you can look on LinkedIn, I think it's still there right now, Disneyland here in Southern California, they're starting in the tech shop at 35 bucks an hour 
and you only have to have two years experience. It used to be, wow. that was, that's crazy. And they still, like my buddy was telling me, he said, we still can't get, we still can't get people. Well, even, that, even at that. So take that from a company that pays really well. Right. And then mm-hmm. shrink that down to the church world. <laughs> yeah. You well, know, and I, I had wondered through COVID if we wouldn't actually see some of the opposite. Cause, cause we were seeing tour guys, they were, they were home for all of a sudden a year, maybe even two. And they were like, Ooh, I actually like my family and my kids and I kind of want to be home more. And I thought there was a chance we'd see a lot of those guys end up getting into the church. Um, but I think that the challenge is, um, most of those guys, and I've talked to a few of them, so I know this is at least the case in a few, they looked at church opportunities to get into production and they went, you want me to do what for what? Right. <laughs> no, yeah. no, yeah. I can, I can go do so many other jobs, be healthier, be better taken care of, um, and be way less stressed out. Mm. There are so many online opportunities. Now we asked ourselves, where did all the workers go? I mean, not just online. I mean, you've got people around the country making six figures as Uber drivers. Mm-hmm. And there's so many opportunities now to make money from your home and not have to go anywhere. When and we're so, done, I'd like to talk to you about an opportunity on Instagram. I think you could be a great influencer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, seriously. Serious. There are just so many opportunities now. And that's why for us, I mean, especially in the in the church staffing space, it's like we have to be we have to be incredible advocates for yeah. the churches and ministries that we're working with, partnering with, to draw the, the kind of people in that we need. And we have to be translators about the opportunity. We have to be translators to the church or ministry about the value of a candidate we're showing them that may not have as much op- uh, uh, as much yeah. experience, and we right. have to we have to translate the opportunity of the church or ministry to the candidate to say, "This is why you want to serve at this ministry. This is what's happening at this ministry. This is how they have innovated coming out of the pan- pandemic. This is a life change that you'll get to be a part of." It's all about churches realizing that it's it's more the candidate interviewing them now and yeah. then and then realizing you know we used to we used to say that well hey we'll get you we'll we'll, we'll get the 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 candidate we'll get you to like the the 20 yard line uh and and you've got to do the rest but now it's now it's 30 yard line at best and then you've got to go okay church ministry you need to tell a great story and then you need to realize that ultimate fit is going to come in the first 12 to 24 months of them being on staff because you're going to have to invest in this leader and you're going to have to bring this leader along and you're going to have to really uh, look after them and, 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 and give them development opportunities, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, I think that's what's really hard because um, a lot of pastors are stretched thin, even in bigger churches, they're stretched thin. They're doing like 25 jobs and they're like, okay, I'm going to spend, I'm going to spend this money We're going to get this guy or girl that's the right fit, the closest we can get. And then I'm still going to have to continue to invest in them. And you're like, yeah, because you're a pastor and you're supposed to, you don't just pastor the people. You have to pastor your staff. Yeah. I think all of us have, have, have been in situations where there have been pastors on staff. So we've known that they're just not good pastors to the staff. Right. Um, One of the things that I think uh, uh, Stan was so good at at Mariners is he was a phenomenal pastor to everybody on the staff. And one of the reasons that he was so revered is because, you know, the people in the church loved him, but the but the staff adored him because he was just he he encouraged people. He he did all the things you would want a pastor to do with you being on staff. And I think it's I think, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of pastors don't get trained how to do that, <laughs> like how to. Well, help let's help let's hold people. let's hold on to this because I actually think there's a whole another podcast on this because this this whole be, the leader of leaders thing has been an issue for a long time. Um, because I think a lot of times when pastors get in, you know, especially if they start small and work their way up, mm. you know, they're they're the guy who has to do everything, right? They're right. they're visiting hospitals, they're doing this, they're doing that, and all of a sudden you get a staff of fifteen, twenty, and it's it's 
what I see often is it's like, well, I hired you to do that. I don't need to lead right. you, mentor you, guide you, whatever. So I think there's a whole discussion here. So let's hold off to that for just a minute because we're we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I think there's there's kind of two things that I'd love to. Oh, whoa, my venue. I, I'll I, have to. It, I don't know if I'll even edit that out. That was no, so just leave it. I, that I was like it. right. I want to see you do that again, dude. That's uh that's the that's my effects engine. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> the reaction was almost as good as the effect. I that's know, how right? you know it's not a green screen, folks. He's really he's really where he says he is. Yeah, no, we actually had to take the uh, the lyrics off because they were making the camera change color temperature. So it was great. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I think the two things I'd love to talk about for for our last couple minutes are are number one, if you're a church looking to hire production staff, like what are a couple of keys you should be really thinking about as you kind of head into this? And then I'd love to take the flip side of that too, is if you're a, if you're a person looking to either change positions, change churches, or even get into production for the first time, um, like what do they need to know to get be successful? So start, start from the church perspective. Uh, I'm a pastor, I'm a worship leader, I'm, I'm a whoever, and I'm looking at hiring somebody either for the first time or again, like, what are you guys coaching them um, to, to be thinking about and, and doing as they get into this? Yeah. The, I mean, the first thing is giving uh, churches a sense of the environment out there and what it's going to cost for you to start mm. that position. Uh, usually to replace the role, it's going to be more in this current environment just because of what we're seeing happen with the economy. And if you're starting for the very first time, you've got to realize what you're going to get for what you want to pay. And then it's working out what this person realistically is going to bring to your staff and moving the mission and vision forward of the church and to prioritize those things. Because so often people go in with an unrealistic expectation of all the things they're going to get. And what we do at Slingshot is, is we'll, we have a proprietary match tool that we can list those competencies out. And uh, and we can rate those and say, hey, what's higher? What's more important? What's less important? Because you've got to realize that once we get into, we always say personalities drive searches. Once you start connecting with personalities, uh, you're going to be starting to look at, okay, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this leader, this right. candidate? Because all of the, everybody has their strengths and, and weaknesses. And so it's, it's, it's walking into this with eyes wide open. And for that, you need to get outside advice from um, guys like you, people like us. Conversations are free. And then you work out how you want to invest what you have to invest in this hire. And anything you invest is going to pay off. I mean, yeah. running the search on your own is almost impossible in this day and age. And so if you're going to try it, be ready for, uh, I mean, if God wills it and you can do it on your own, just be ready for the intensity of it. But also don't let it go too long that you get fatigued so that when you do partner with a staffing mm. group, you're not already past it and, and just so fatigued with the process. So you want to be very careful on how long you try it on your own, but also just having outside advice from, from guys like you who have done this, who know it, who see it. It's so, so important not to go it alone. Well, and I see that with quite a few pastors. In fact, um, uh, years ago, when I transitioned from being a tech director to be on the integration, one of our clients actually came to us and said, yeah, I just had to fire my tech director and you guys, you guys built this car. I don't know how to drive it. And I just thought, you know, that's brilliant because how many pastors or leadership teams are going, we can hire this guy. We know what we need. And it's like, well, have you ever had a great tech director before? Right. Uh, and if so, how did you find them? And the answer usually is, is not really. We haven't found the guy we like yet. And it's like, why do you think that's going to change now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you, I mean, you've got to you got to know, Duke. We don't have uh, people from our senior leadership division. Van, Van will know this. We don't have we had we don't have, we don't have search associates from our senior leadership division running tech searches. Right. We have tech guys, or we have worship guys that have run tech ministries that are doing these searches because you've got to have a practitioner. Well, oh, I've lost audio and I lost Duke. I can't hear you. That's weird. Weird. I got you back. My phone is doing all kinds of fun things. Uh, I've lost Van. Can you hear Van? Van, Van, you're muted. Or something. There we go. Here we, go. Here we go. That's better. Cool. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. So let's so, let's pick that back up. 
Well, you you had him what he said, right? Yep. What, so, uh, what was the last thing I there. said? I don't know. I was going to change the subject. Oh, anyway, so. oh, yeah, I don't. I, have, see, I, I just, don't. Have, in, yeah. yeah, say again have, what you said about about senior yeah. leadership. Yeah, we don't have people who aren't tech people running searches for tech people. That's basically what I said. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, that's even from the start, that was that way because I, I think I was probably one of the first one or two people that Monty had asked to, yep. you know, to, to be tech, to do tech searches. And then um, we had, uh, after you, we had Jane Kim. You remember that? Yep. Yeah. And yep. then we've yep. had a number through, throughout the years who have brought, who have stayed great friends of Slingshot. I mean, Van, I'll call you every now and then and say, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? It's so important to have that network. And that right. network. Yeah. Is, is what we used to get to the right people too. Well, and, and, you know, it's so funny. We, we, uh, we worked with the church that you guys did eventually work with who the day we started, you know, they asked us, you know, we were going through our process and they said, you know, what's the biggest problem. And I had, I had been at the church on a Sunday and just watched the entire thing for, uh, I just took notes and that's all I did. And I said, well, pastor, the truth of the matter is we can fix your tech problems, but we can't fix your people problems. Right. Right. And, yeah. um, uh, you have some people problems and here's the list of what they are, you know, and I was, we were very blunt with them and, and that church is still a partner with us today. And basically pastor said, what would you do if you were me? And I said, well, we would call slingshot <laughs> and yeah. we would, cause you've got to have some, a real worship pastor and a real technical director that are partners with you in ministry. Yeah, not just right. not just people, yeah. but people who are actually on the same page with you, who are rowing the boat in the same direction as you and who understand what's happening and are called. I think one of the things you said earlier that I loved was that the one thing that about telling good stories to the people who are you're trying to get to be in these positions is you have to it's a calling. All of us who are tech directors, we know. And I, we tell tech directors this all the time. If you want to be in church as, cause it's a good steady job, that is a terrible reason to be a tech director. Yeah. Don't do it. It's possibly the worst type reason to be a tech I, director. You know what, Van? I got the best advice, um, as a kid, when I said to my grandfather, who was a hero for me, he was a pastor for many, many years. I said, I think I want to be a pastor when I grow up. And he goes, let me give you some advice. Try everything else first. Mm -hmm. And if God's still calling you to ministry, that's yeah. the people we want on the front lines. But you said it too, that the people issue, I mean, it's only a little bit about the gear. That's we, we know that, don't we? Right. It's yeah. so much about the people and the mission. And therein lies the, the, the need for the unicorn. You guys are that yeah. and you've lived it, but it's finding, and a tech director has to be so focused on the people and the ministry, then the gear. Unless right. you have a worship pastor who is going to get more involved in that for the tech director and the tech director is more focused on the gear, or you've got a tech director who's a people person and a generalist that has other people, contractors working for them that are about the gear. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, I think the contracting thing has con kind of gone full circle because when I started way back in the day with Saddleback, I mean, we were all, they were hiring people from outside of the church. That's how I got in. I was, I was working for an integrator and I toured and, and stuff like that. So they hired me specifically because I wasn't a sound guy in the church. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, and so that's kind of how it was, but that was, you know, 25 years ago. And I think there was a lot of that. You still see it in some big churches, but I think we're flipping back around to where they're having to hire qualified professionals. But wouldn't you say, though, if they do that, they at least somebody still has to manage and maintain the volunteers. I mean, Absolutely. If, you have, if you have and that and that will probably fall to the worship pastor. So does the worship pastor have, you know, yeah. have margin for that, too? So, I mean, that's a whole nother. Yeah. Thing. Often when we go in, we're going to have to do a whole ministry area assessment a big ministry and work out, okay, what, where are the gaps? What needs to be filled here? Yeah. What's the kind of person what are the, that we need to find and the skills that they need to have. Right. And I think that's yeah. one of the reasons that we recommend y'all so much is because we have a similar process for the integration side. And you guys have that same, same similar process for the people side, because uh -huh. it is so important to understand what is actually happening in the church. Yeah. How it's how things transpire every week, what the dynamic is between the staff and the people mm -hmm. and all the things um, to just really understand how to help churches the best. So it's right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it sounds like I'm sales pitching slingshot and I am a little bit because I love them so much, but the bottom line, (laughs) what we always tell people is look, just like with a, just like with integration, this is all we do. Yeah. Yeah. We don't tell you how to preach your message. We don't tell you any of that stuff. We don't tell you who, who actually you're serving or what your outreach is going to be. So if we don't tell you that, you know, one of the reasons you're bringing us in is to do what we do best, you yeah. know, and I, and I, and if I can encourage anybody that is on the fence about hiring a slingshot or a company like slingshot, if you can do it, you should, because it will put you miles ahead and they're going to ask so many questions that, n- that you have never even thought of. And I guarantee you most pastors don't have the, yeah. the brain space yeah. to, to, uh, to make good hires like, you know, like you guys are going to do so. And you know what I think the similarity would be as well, Van, is it, it remains a true partnership. The partnerships that, that aren't as great for us are the ones where they think they can just hire us. We give them a bunch of names and it's over. Um, it's like when we, with you guys with integration, I'm sure. It, it's got to be a partnership the whole way uh, right. for it to be successful. Yeah. And we yeah. don't, and on, honestly, you know, you said uh, back they were, inter- you know, they, they're interviewing uh, the, the church as much as the church is interviewing them. I actually tell pastors that now about us. I say, well, when I'm talking to you, I'm interviewing you as much as you're interviewing us because projects are hard. And if we don't like each other, if we're not the right fit, I don't care. Man, I say it all the time. It's going to get messy. And for us, I mean, I, I know it's different in the integration world, but for us, we're dealing with people and people don't do what you expect them to do. It gets messy. It's not different. Almost never. <laughs> no. And so it's going to get messy. So I always say when people are talking to us, and it used to only be us and maybe one other company doing this. Now there's a lot of people doing it uh, and it's not easy. It's a, uh, some days it's a reluctant calling. And the reason I, I say I, I think we're one of the, if not the best at it, is because we've been doing it so long and we have the systems and the people and the experience. If you're going in for heart surgery, you want the heart surgeon that's done thousands of heart surgeries, right? not the heart right. surgeon that's done a few or, or, or just overseen some. But, and but so, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, so. Uh, uh, right. I play a doctor on television. Yeah, yeah so there you go. And yeah. so, you know, we're, it's, it's, we're, we're always saying go with the group that you right, feel right. culturally and relationally aligned with because, and, and that you feel like you trust the most because it's right, going right. to get messy and the relationship is going to get tested. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, with, in, with two minutes left, if, if somebody's listening to this and they're thinking about changing positions or getting yeah. into production for the first time, um, what, what's, what's some, some key advice you've got for those folks? Uh, those changing positions, uh, make sure you're released from where you are because it's a God thing and it's a spiritual thing deep down. And if you're not released and you think that it's going to be way better somewhere else, you go <laughs> wherever you go. You take you wherever you go. And you want to learn what God has for you and you don't want to leave a place until you're released. So commit it to prayer and work out if you're released and really ready to move or whether you just need to have some critical conversations with your leaders. Uh, but if you're ready to move, do it with integrity. Uh, invite your leadership in at the appropriate time to be praying with you as you discern and then talk to a group like us to give you advice because we that that's what we love to do. Our secret source is our candidate pool and people see us as safe harbor and we are and we can have conversations with you and help you process that move and align expectations. Thinking about getting into it for the first time, make sure you've got experience Make sure you've uh, you've volunteered and got and and gotten experience in the role, gotten necessary training, understand the equipment. It's not all roses working for a church. In fact, it's very confronting. And so you want to talk to some tech directors and people that are working in churches and production space already to get a sense of what it's like, and realize that this is a calling and that, that it is a ministry. You're not going to get rich doing it, but I can tell you this, having worked in the church it will be the greatest experience of your life serving and working in the local church. It's an absolute privilege and it's still my greatest love vocationally. Mic awesome. drop. I like it. Awesome. All right. Well, well we're going to, we're going to keep you over cause we want to talk. Uh, I want to, I want to talk about this, this leader of leaders thing a little bit more. Um, cause that's a, that's a big passion of mine and, and you poke the bear. So, um, 
but uh, we're going to wrap up this episode. So, uh, Tim, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll have we'll have uh, the the slingshot info uh, in the show notes below. Um, but thanks for thanks for listening. Make sure you uh, find us on YouTube and uh, subscribe and like all the things. Um, and uh, we'll we'll put that Instagram opportunity to make all the money down there too. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Evan. So, all right, we'll see yes. you on the next one.